Well, even if you've never seen a single episode of Sugarfoot, you probably remember that theme song. Our guest on the Pop Shop today is Will Hutchins, who was in many, many film and TV roles, but best known as Tom Brewster, alias Sugarfoot, in the famous late 50s, early 60s television show. You know, Will, I'd like to go back to the very beginning. Now, you were born in Los Angeles, right? Yeah, B.S., before smog. (laughs) It was a wonderful place in the off. It was paradise. It's hard to believe now, but it was. The, the, the tallest building was this, uh, City Hall, 15 stories. It's always fun when I watch uh, like a, a Laurel and Hardy movie or oh, something like that, and they show did, the did neighborhood. Did they look great then? Yeah, yeah. Oh, oh, you said just the right thing. And Buster <laughs> Keaton, too. Sure. He was able to pull U-turns in the street in those <laughs> <Right>. days. <laughs> now, did you always want to be in uh, show business? Well, I was just telling some people that today. I, I, I remember the first thing I remember in life was being in my crib and my mom bringing a pretty lady. I remember she was pretty over to see me, and I made her laugh. And that was a <laughs> wonderful feeling. And I, I, I was an only child, and my mom worked, which was very unusual in our neighborhood in those days. The, the mother stayed home and the fathers worked. And I didn't, my dad split the sheets. So uh, I, was kinda, I had to use my imagination a lot because I was alone a lot. And... Uh, I wasn't that good in school, and the teacher put me in a play, and my sights were set, I guess. I majored in uh, drama at Pomona College. I was the first uh, drama major ever there. And then I, uh, when I came back from the Army, I went to UCLA in the film school there on the GI Bill. Obviously, everybody knows you from Sugarfoot. It's anybody an... remembers. Yeah, well, they, they <laughs> anybody remember. was alive then. <laughs> <laughs> well, you you don't you don't you didn't see it, did you? When no, you... I was I was too young for when yeah. it was on, but I saw it later. You know, they keep reviving it every once in a while. On you know, there's a, a TV station. What was it? The Good Life or some network? Oh, we like never that? got that. So we depended on the kindness of friends to send us, uh, you know, copies. But most of them aren't very good. Bet Warner's, after all these years, has released the first season. So I, I, I've got those on in good quality, really good quality. I hope they catch on so I can get the whole four years. Oh, I'm sure they would. I'm surprised. You know, there are a lot of people that really remember that show, especially that song. It, oh, any- the song was it. <laughs> yeah. That song was originally written by, uh, well, it was written by uh, Max Steiner. You oh, know, okay. King Kong and all that. Yeah. And Tara, you know, and. <laughs> and it was for a movie called Sugarfoot with uh, Randolph Scott. Needless to say, he was a lot different, and I was a lot different. We weren't the same. And uh, then, then when uh, the show went on the air, they used the music, and then the show went on for a second season, and they put in Paul Francis Webster, I guess, wrote the lyrics. Right. And uh, I understand that show, uh, uh, Arrested Development, Somebody, people are all like, I guess that's a big hit because people come up to me and say, hey, you were on Arrested Development last night. <laughs> These guys get together and they try to remember the words to the song and they, I guess they sing it. It's a good song because the words are good too. I mean, you're like uh, Venanza, you know, you don't think of the words. Right. There are words, but you don't think of them. And I've gotten a little trouble. Oh, boy. You know, uh, America, what has given the world in its music? I mean, I don't think there's any country that comes close to all this, the music we've produced on all all genres and and western westerns have such great theme songs. Oh, I, I've often said that the absolute best music in movies you'll hear it in westerns. Uh, oh God, and they cap they capture it beautifully. Oh sure. A lot of these guys came over from Russia. What do they know? And they write these <laughs> great songs. Well, they see the landscape, you know, they see the scenery if they're yeah. out there in Wyoming or something with a John yeah. Ford movie, and uh, next thing you know, they've got this sweeping panoramic music. I mean, oh. it's just fantastic. John Ford was uh, wonderful with his music. Oh, he really came. I guess he had music on the set yeah. to help the actors get in the mood. Boy, that's a great tool to use. Now, leading up to Sugarfoot, were you a contract player at uh, Warner Brothers? Well, thanks to UCLA, they had an all-points bulletin for uh, college students to try out for the show. This is another one before your time called Matinee Theater. Mm -hmm. Every day at noon, at least in L.A., it was a live show. So it it would be 3 o'clock in the afternoon in New York. A live show every day. And each day it uh, was a different story, different cast. 
And so my buddy comes in. I'm half asleep in the morning. He says, come on, we're going to go over to NBC. I want you to, we're going to try it for that uh, college show. And I said, no, I'm too tired. He said, come on, come on. Boy, I owe him a lot. <laughs> and it was, so we went over there, and I was so tired, I crawled under the piano and fell asleep. Well, all the other people tried out, and I was the only one left, and I went in and they gave me the lead. I, I noticed in, in, I used to be in speech tournaments, and the last guy would usually get a better score, and I think that applies to gymnastics and ice skating and stuff like that, too. Yeah, probably. Yeah, so that I got the lead, and that was really a... A uh, really very lurid show. I never saw it. I think I'd probably awful in it, but they 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 used me three more times, and then one or saw one of them or two of them and uh, called me over. You know, they they were very tight with the buck. Right. <laughs> well, it was not much up from serfdom, so they, they weren't taking much of a chance. And they put me under contract, and they had a, a show called Conflict. Mm-hmm. Uh, they had a lot of series that were based with titles that were movies. Now, Conflict was a Humphrey Bogart movie in which he was a murderer. And uh, Cheyenne was a, a, <laughs> a movie with uh, Dennis Morgan, a Western. Right. And, and he, I, I remember that vividly because he had the worst review I've ever heard an actor get. Uh, it said, uh, Mr. Morgan entered the saloon preceded by his stomach. <laughs> oh, how would you like to have that written by you? Goodness. <laughs> and so that was a series. And uh, Colt 45 was another it was a movie before it was a TV series. So I did a few of these bucolic kind of shows on conflict. And one of them was called Stranger on the Road, which I really loved. I'd love to get a copy of that, uh, in which I got on the horse backwards. And that, that kind of symbolizes Sugarfoot in a nutshell. Yeah, yeah you're right. Yeah, I, I guess something clicked with them <laughs> because that led to Sugarfoot. And I remember the, the first page, it said, a guy's riding along on his horse. It looks like Will Hutchins. In fact, it is Will Hutchins. I thought, the boy, that was neat. Yeah. Well, that was based on a movie called The Boy from Oklahoma, which was a Will Rogers Jr. movie. That's right, yeah. And my name, real name is Marshall Hutchinson, and they thought that was too long, so they shortened it to Will Hutchins. And I thought that was funny, because a year later they signed uh, Ephraim Zimbalist Jr. <laughs> they didn't even cut off the junior. That's right. It could have just been Rum Zim or something. Yeah. <laughs> Well, they had those, you know, like Rock Hudson, Tab Hunter, Dum Dum Dum, right, Will right. Hutchins. Like, I would like to have been like Montgomery Clift or Marlon Brando or Maria Ospenskaya or something like that. <laughs> but I'm assuming it must have been a big thrill for you to be cast in the lead uh, of a Western because you probably grew up watching Cowboys on screen. Oh, I, I'm i so lucky that I grew up in the 30s when we had the Saturday matinee, yeah. a dime to get in a nickel for candy or popcorn. And we, and our mothers never worried about us because it took all day to show uh, the, the two movies, the A movie and the B movie, which we liked the love the most, and the serials and the cartoons and the, the newsreels. We were there all day, and uh, I'm so glad I grew up on that. And I grew up uh, grew up loving the westerns. And we had a theater in Hollywood called the, the Hitching Post. Mm. So my mom would let me go into Hollywood on Saturday, take the bus in, and I'd, I'd just go to like Grauman's Chinese or the Egyptian or Pantages. And then I went over to the Hitching Post and to see what I really loved, the, the, the B-Westerns. Well, and here you are playing Sugarfoot on uh, TV, and here's a cowboy who's not very good. Yeah, well, uh, Sugarfoot, uh, the definition is a guy that's trying to work his way up to being a tenderfoot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was a, a tenderant uh, cowboy going from town to town, getting odd jobs and studying uh, law by mail. Are you the new sheriff? Yes, I am. My father believed in that badge and what it stood for. He gave his life for it. I don't like to see it made a laughing stock. Aside from Barney Turlock and Billy the Kid, he was the fastest draw this country ever had. And you can't even shoot straight. Shooting ain't always the answer. It's beyond me why a person like you would even want to be sheriff. No, 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 just cool off your boiler. Just because you're wearing britches don't give you the right to holler like a cowhand. Barney offered me the job for the very reason that I ain't a gunslinger. How could he? How could he what? Call my father a common gunslinger. Oh, he didn't. He just said that since... Then why would he replace the finest, bravest, squarest man that ever lived with you? 
Sugarfoot. Sometimes you just have to take what comes along. Well, I'm what came along. That's a scene from a classic episode of Sugarfoot. Our guest today, Will Hutchins on the Vintage Rock and Pop Shop. You know, Will, I think of that time period. I think really the late 50s, early 60s, really the peak of of television in terms of quality. We were just talking about that today. I think it was a big tragedy when everything moved west because New York had so many great live dramas. Yeah. Just terrific stuff. And it was just, of course, we didn't have all the choices, but everything on was was a mint show to somebody or other. Oh, sure. You had Playhouse 90 and, and shows like that. Uh, you know what my grandfather's favorite show was? What's that? The Indian Head. The Indian Head? You know, one o'clock in the morning. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> 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 going off the air. <laughs> <laughs> and you had to get up, you know, you had to be in better shape because you had to get up and walk across the room to change channels. <laughs> That's true, yeah. Yeah, you had to work your abs. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I just think of all the great shows that were on around that time period. I mean, you've got your show, Maverick, uh, Route 66. I mean, an oh, entirely yeah. different show. I mean, just brilliant uh, scripts. Oh, yeah. You know, you know, I didn't appreciate how good our scripts were. I've I was always writing sarcastic comments in the in the um, margin, but uh, now I watch them and I say, "Oh, if I'd only worked a little harder on that, I, <laughs> the writer sure worked good on it. I should have worked as hard as he did and made it better than it was because he—that's a good script." So I was wrong, and they were right. <laughs> <laughs> Let me ask you: Are there any TV shows on now that you enjoy watching at all? Well, um, I, I don't want to be an old fuddy-duddy, but uh, we watch my wife and I watch a lot of politics, and you know, especially during the uh, campaigns and everything. Oh, sure, yeah. Watch a lot of that, and then I watch a lot of sports, and then I have to go upstairs. But you know, my favorite channel is TCM. Oh, of course, movies. yeah. I think that just it, it just all those great movies from the past. Oh, oh, and, and you know, I got the, uh, the guy from uh, Warner Brothers called me up about uh, to uh, about you know the Sugarfoot being re released now on DVD, right. and he says, "Is there anything you can?" Uh, you, you want? Well, he's going to send me some uh, of the sets of Sugarfoot. Oh wow! He, he's, yeah, I'll get him out his presents because we only need one, <laughs> and uh, we already bought that. Right. And, uh, and he said, "Anything you want?" And I, my mind didn't, uh, as usual, didn't click in the, clearly. And I should have asked him for those con- conflict shows because of all the shows I ever did at Warner's, I don't have those. But anyhow, I, I told him a picture I saw when I was also a little kid, Shh, the octopus. He'd never heard of that. Mm-mm. I don't know if anybody else has. But they show it on TCM once in a while, but I didn't uh, tape it. And it all takes place in a, in a lighthouse. And it's kind of a ghostly thing. Uh, the octopus, you know, go, yeah, ghosty. <laughs> yeah, of course. So I remember that one with Hugh Herbert and Alan Jenkins. and So he said, okay, he's going to send me uh, shh, the octopus. And, you know, we've talked about it in passing, but we should mention to the audience officially that the first season of Sugarfoot is out on DVD, courtesy of Warner Brothers, and you can find it if you go on over to CriticsChoice.com. And as we start to wrap up here, I I can't let you go without mentioning Elvis Presley. You did two movies with Elvis Presley. What was it like working with him? Well, I've worked with a lot of fine actors and actresses and I've met a lot of great people in showbiz and all, and all you know, the, the cameramen, some of the great cameramen and the writers. And, but of all the people I worked with, Elvis is my favorite. I mean, I just thought he was the greatest. He didn't get the greatest material. Yeah. But, and I think that was a tragedy for him because early, like he did, um, Kid, uh, what was that like one? King of, Creole, yeah. King Creole. Yep. And um, Jailhouse Rock. And I wrote in one of my columns, uh, you can talk about uh, Brando and you can talk about James Dean. But to me, Elvis and Jailhouse Rock was had more power in his performance. He didn't go his own way. I, that, I remember uh, the guy in um, From Here to Eternity. He said, if a man don't go his own way, he's nothing. And I think that Elvis should have gone his own way more than he did. He relied too much on other people. You know, his, you know had his mafia with him and all. Yep, yep. But I'm telling you, I never had a better time than working with him on uh, Clambake. We just and, and you know the director was a great guy uh, Arthur Nadell, and his father uh, worked at MGM during the days of the uh, Marx Brothers, and those guys were so wild. It's hard to believe this, but they were so wild they actually had to get a cage on the set and round <laughs> them up and put them in the cage until they got all three of them together and they could make go on with the, the movie. 
So Arthur Nadell was used to that. And th- this picture was crazy, too, because it was in <laughs> de facto Elvis's uh, stag party, one long stag party, because he got married to the right. beautiful Miss Priscilla in a couple of weeks after the movie. And so we just had a wild time. Uh, and, and Elvis is going around all the time saying, help us out, everybody, help us out. <laughs> and uh, so at the end of the show, we had a party, and he gave me a giant picture of himself in a red shirt, and he said, help us out, Will. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, he, he, we got along great. I worked with him also in uh, Spin Out. Yeah. And I didn't find this out from Elvis, but long after he died, a guy came up to me at one of these conventions, you know, it was a radio convention, as a matter of fact. Mm-hmm. I, I love going to those and working with the old radio actors. And a guy came up to me and he said he, he'd heard from Red West, yep. one of Elvis's cronies, that uh, Elvis's favorite uh, uh, guys that he worked with were, were Bill Bixby and me. Huh. And he, he actually, he, 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 wanted, he wanted to make, I guess he didn't like that nun movie he made there. Oh, yeah, and, Change of Habit. Yeah. yeah. And he wanted to make one more crazy movie like Clambake, and he wanted me to be his sidekick. So that, that's the greatest, about the greatest thrill I ever had. Because working on his movies were like one big party. And he'd go around making sure everybody was happy. He'd spend time with me. One time he invited me into his dressing room right on there on the set in a big trailer. It was on the, actually on the sound stage where they made uh, Phantom of the Opera, the original. So it had a lot of vibes wow. going there. So I got in, the, in his dressing room, and he pulled out an LP, and I said, whoa. I'm going to be the first kid on my block to hear Elvis's latest and greatest. <laughs> what it was was Charles Boyer reciting love poetry. <laughs> so there was so much more to him oh, yeah. than I've ever read anywhere. I don't know if a book's ever been written that's captured it, but he, he had so much magic uh, to me. There was so much magic to that guy. And he was one take. And I was 20 takes Hutchinson. <laughs> one day we had a scene where I have to, I'm supposed to be putting on a necktie, which I hardly ever do. I'm supposed to be looking in a mirror, but because of the camera angle, I couldn't look in the mirror. 20 takes, and he was getting more and more rambunctious because the lovely Miss Priscilla was off in the shadows, and he wanted to rush to her. Right. I finally got it right, and zoom, and he was gone. <laughs> well, I don't blame him. <laughs> <laughs> she was she was quite a dish <laughs> in 1967. That's still is, sure. Yeah, yeah, still is, still yeah. is. I'll tell you this, I, I made the decision as I'm talking to you that we, at some point in the near future, we're going to have to have a part two of this, oh, of well, this interview. Well, you you really know how to do it, because usually they call up and say, all right, and then you can hear the commercial, and they say, now, ladies and gentlemen, they hear all that, and then, you're on, and I go, you <laughs> None of that with you. Well, I, I, I appreciate that. I think it's also because I'm probably a fan of the same things that you're a fan of. Yeah, uh, I'd like to hear your, your your take on the TV shows today sometime when you have time to do that. Well, I'll tell you what, it's been a thrill talking to you. I, I, Thanks for talking. I, I, I could go on forever talking to you. Well, I'll tell you what, I, we'll, <laughs> <laughs> we'll have to do it again sometime. Okay. And I want to remind everybody that you can uh, read Will Hutchins' column over at Western Clippings, which is a Western's uh, fan site and fanzine, and that's westernclippings.com. Then uh, you can you can buy your uh, first season of Sugarfoot, folks, and they're all those are really good shows. Yeah, uh, hadn't fallen off the horse that much, so I was still <laughs> clear thinking. <laughs> all right, thanks so much, Will. Okay, thank you, Ghosty. All righty, bye bye. Bye.